Well, hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to this edition of the NZX Virtual Investor Event. My name is Doug Vrame. I'm from the Issuer Relationships team at the New Zealand Exchange. Today, we've got three presenters um, who've taken the time to put some thoughts together. Two of them are, are listed on NZX, and uh, our first presenter is um, a financial education platform for women. We'll get to those details in a, in a moment, but just wanted to remind you of the format. Each presenter will go for 15 minutes, uh, plus or minus, and then there'll be a five minute Q&A section uh, or session. The way, the way you um, ask questions is through the chat function on your webcam panel. We encourage you to ask as many questions as you can. We'll gather them at the end of the presenter's uh, time and I'll ask the questions and then you'll, you'll hear the answers. Anything we don't get to, we'll forward an email after the fact, so, so don't be shy about questions. The more the, more the better. Um, there'll also be a link, a YouTube link, followed up so you can watch this again if needed. And I believe that is it. So I will start with um, uh, our first presenter and I'll introduce Victoria Harris. Uh, Victoria is the uh, co-founder and head of finance for The Curve. Uh, the Curve is an education platform to help women cut through the noise and learn more about money. So I will uh, turn it over to Victoria now and we'll be back in a few minutes with questions. So thanks, Victoria. Hi, everyone. Thank, thanks, Doug. Thanks for that introduction. Um, so yeah, like, like Doug said, my name is Victoria and I am co-founder of The Curve. Uh, which is a, an investing education platform for women. Um, I also wear another hat as well, um, and um, and that's my full full time job, which is a portfolio manager at Devon Funds. Um, so I kind of kind of wearing two hats at the moment, and and not having too much of a social life. But 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 no, it's great. It keeps me busy and keeps me out of trouble. Um, I guess a bit about me, but before I go into the curve, uh, so I've been in the finance industry for about ten years now. Um, so I've worked, um, I've been fortunate to work at a number of, of um, New Zealand's top fund managers. So I started my career at Milford Asset Management as an analyst. Um, and then and I was covering uh, Australasian equities there. Um, and then I moved to Pi Funds, um, covering, covering global equities uh, over there and running their global growth fund. Um, and then more recently, I've just joined Devon uh, as, as a portfolio manager of um, a sustainability fund and an Australian fund. So back covering, covering Australasian equities, which is much better time zone wise. Um, and I've actually had the pleasure of working in um, Sydney, Auckland uh, and London as well. So, um, so I've worked and worked in numerous cities as well. I guess as in my portfolio management role, I um, so I'm, I'm constantly researching and looking for investment ideas for, to invest on behalf of, of clients. Um, so we're always kind of out and about looking for, for for new ideas as well as kind of monitoring what's currently in the portfolio. Um, I guess throughout my career, um, so you know in the past kind of ten years or so. Um, the curve kind of came about, you know, th throughout that I had a number of uh, females in particular uh, come up to me um, and kind of say to me, hey Vic, uh, can I just sit down with you for five minutes? Look, I've got a bit of money saved now and I don't know don't know where to go I, um, you know, to start my investing journey. Um, you know, I really want to learn the basics uh, or, um, you know, and to pick your brain because there's words I don't understand and all this, I had just more and more friends and family members coming to me just, you know, wanting five minutes of my time and I, I couldn't even myself point them to, to kind of one place to go to learn um, and to start that investing journey. It was kind of like, I'll go here to learn this or go here to learn this or, or I can tell you what that means. Um, and I kind of thought, hang on a second, there's, there's definitely an opportunity there. Um, how great would it be if we could just point them to one place um, and, and that can be like the kind of go-to place to, to start their, their investing journey. So while I was in between jobs, um, about a year ago, I, I launched The Curve um, with, with a friend of mine. So The Curve, what, what is The Curve? So effectively, we, like I said, we're an education platform for women to learn about investing uh, and finance. Uh, so we, we're really just there to essentially break down those barriers when it comes to learning about, about finance and investing, um, remove the jargon, um, you know, really explain things in simple terms. Um, you know, we want to be, we want to be the go-to place for women to learn, um, you know, and, and to start, to start 
their investing and start growing their wealth. Uh, we cater to all women of, of, of all backgrounds, um, all ages. Uh, we, we started targeting um, kind of 25 to 45 year olds because we, we thought that's when women, that the age that women tend to you know, have their first job or saving, have got a bit of savings or are wanting to save for a house, you know, that, that kind of, um, that, that kind of stage of life was our target. But, um, you know, as time's gone on and, you know, over the last kind of 12 months, we've really noticed that we, we, we're catering to um, women as young as kind of 16 to 18 and all the way up to, to the likes of um, kind of 65 year olds. So, um, you know, you've got you've got a whole bunch of women in there that at the older end that 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 aren't clued up on this kind of stuff and they don't want their their children to be in the same position as them. Or you've got a lot of uh, women who might uh, be divorced from their partner or their partner might have passed away and they've got a really steep learning curve when it comes to to money. Um, so and then at the younger end, you've obviously got um, you've got the likes of Sheezies and Hatch and State that have really created this. Uh, awareness of investing and so there's we're kind of moving down the down the curve excuse the pun in terms of in terms of this younger demographic really getting on board earlier which is great um, and so we're kind of seeing really broad range of, of women that are kind of coming to the curve um, but we are purely education so we don't give any advice um, we just provide the tools uh, and and the foundations for, for for those women to to learn to learn more um, I guess what is why why are we different? You know, you, so some of you may be thinking there's a lot of a lot of places out there where you can learn learn this kind of stuff, and, and that's true. But I think um, being a place that is created by women for women um, really really makes a difference um, aesthetically, um, in terms of just the way that we deliver our content um, uh, to 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 everything from you know, just bring that safe space that women can ask questions and, and know that they're not going to get judged or, um, or or ridiculed or anything like that. So really just, you know, creating that open safe space. We don't use any kind of investing jargon or anything. Um, and yeah, it's really, really, really a place for women not to feel intimidated, whatever level of investing knowledge that they have. Um, so I guess at the curve, what, what, what do we offer? So we offer a wide range of content uh, at the moment and we're constantly building on that content. So um, currently all the majority of our content is free content. So we have, um, we run in-person events, which are ticketed events. Um, we have about four or five of them a year. Um, we, we have a podcast which has proved to be really successful, um, which is which is great, and that's it. That's that's a free podcast, um, and we found this really resonated with women because you know you can listen to it when you're on your morning walk, you can listen to it if you're, if you're breastfeeding, you can really it's a really kind of flexible way um, to digest that information, and and the the, the format of the podcast is that. Um, there, there is our the, the other co-founder Sophie, who is also learning with our community, and I'm teaching her the basic concepts, and she's really asking those questions that our listeners or our community are, are kind of asking. So, they, they a lot of feedback has been that um, you know that the podcast is really, really relatable. Um, we do a lot of blogs and articles and videos on education um, around investing and finance, everything from kind of uh, we'll do we'll, we'll do, go through budgeting all the way up to kind of you know how do you actually uh, invest in a company or or, or, or trade a stock, um, and we do do corporate workshops so that's coming into to, into workplaces to teach to upskill their staff, um, and I guess coming soon we've been working really hard we've got a number of um, uh, events in the pipeline we're about to launch online courses. Um, and personal workshops, uh, as well as season two of the podcast, um, which which was really exciting, and and more of a kind of a membership based model to get that um, for people that want want more uh, more content. So what what are we actually trying to achieve, and, and and kind of why are we targeting women specifically? Well, I guess we were kind of all aware of of the gender pay gap, um, and. But the thing is that the investing knowledge gap is actually much, much worse and much more prominent. Um, I remember talking to to some friends of mine, um, a friend of mine, sorry, and she said, 
she was like, I don't know why I just, I never, my, my dad would always have these, these conversations around investing in stocks with my brothers, but not me. And it's that, that's the kind of mentality is that it's, it's not anyone's fault. It's just that we were kind of left behind um, as females when it came to having those conversations. And I think now we're in a much more equal place in terms of workforce and in the workforce right now um, and we're much more equal contributors to the household income but we're still left behind when it comes to investing in knowledge so we've got the money we just don't know what to do with it and the longer that it's been left the more uh, overwhelming uh, or feeling that, that creates of I don't know where to start and and it creates this mountain and um, it, it almost creates a barrier of oh well it's so overwhelming I won't I won't even start at all and that's the kind of the biggest mistake that that we can make um, so this kind of leads to the fact that we because we don't start or because we don't know where to start or it's too overwhelming we are much more likely um, to end up in financial hardship when we retire um, and that's that's why we have a really big focus on on KiwiSaver um, at, at, at the curve as well, and and some we, we go through tips and tricks around how you can um, you can make the most out of your KiwiSaver to to avoid that financial hardship for when you retire. Um, you know, as, as women, we 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 tend to get paid less. Uh, firstly, so therefore we're contributing less to our KiwiSaver. Um, you know, our three percent is different to to a male's three percent. Uh, uh, secondly, we uh, most of us will take time out of the workforce to to have children or, or, or raise a family, so therefore we're not contributing or we're contributing a lower amount. Uh, and then thirdly, we tend to live longer than, than than men when we reach retirement. So we've got a smaller pool and it's got to last longer. So um, that's why we kind of really hone in on some, some tips and tricks that you can do now to to make sure you you you, you know you're in a great financial position when when you come to your retirement. Um, and then I guess why is it why is it so important um, for women? And, and it comes down to the fact that when we do invest, we, we actually invest better than men, surprisingly. Um, and that's because we we put a lot we put more time and effort into into researching our ideas. You know, we like to to um, we don't kind of uh, make irrational decisions as much. Um, you know, which should be should be used to our advantage. Uh, we tend to make um, we were more conscious around risk. Uh, and yes, there's a balance between uh, being too conscious of risk and then putting your money in a term deposit and, and you know, not, not taking any risk at all um, to taking a bit more risk and, and kind of showing, um, you know, what return you can get from just taking uh, a little bit more risk with your portfolio, your investment. And we, we tend to invest for the long term. So we don't get emotionally involved. We don't feel like we have to trade all the time um, like, like, like the majority of men do. So. Um, so those three things really put us, um, you know, in place to actually deliver better returns than men when we do invest. Um, so I guess just some things, that, and this is an example of what we would go through at the curve. Um, like I said, we've got a big focus on KiwiSaver and with that comes, comes the importance of, of, of explaining why compound interest is so important. Um, so yeah, compound interest, it's, it's the eighth wonder of the world, according to Albert Einstein. Um, and it really just shows that over time, uh, if you were Alice, for example, and you were in a 4% fund for 30 years and you started with $20,000, uh, then, then you're going to have $65,000 by the time um, you, reach, you reach retirement. And then if you uh, compare this to Briar, who's in a slightly more risky fund, um, she's got the same time horizon and the same starting balance. Uh, and she's generate, she still have $350,000 when she reaches retirement. So that difference of just making that change from a 4% returning fund per year to 10% returning per year can just make such a difference when it comes to your retirement. And considering that your retirement, you're probably, hopefully, most of us will be there for at least 20 years or so. So, you know, $65,000 for 20 years is, is not a lot. And um, you know, you're in a much better position if you've got that $350,000. And then we also talk about the difference that contributing to your KiwiSaver can make. So the only difference here with Claire is that she contributes a monthly um, amount of $350. And she's a millionaire at, <laughs> at retirement. So. Uh, so there's definitely some some small changes you can make uh, that can really set you up 
for um, you know to have to have a great retirement and not be in that kind of financial hardship position. So we get a lot of positive feedback from our events. We had we had one girl that uh, messaged us saying thank you so much for the information. I went away and I changed my. I didn't realize you know the low return I was getting on my key my default KiwiSaver provider and I'm now earning um, getting X return per per year. And for for us like that's that's kind of that's why we do it. That's why we do the curve is because you know to make you, to, to give that information for someone to make a better decision to make such a difference to their future um, is really kind of um, the ethos of, of the curve and why why we exist. So I think that might be my 15 minutes up, but um, yeah, we're just in summary, we, we are, we, we're here to help. Um, we're here to break down those barriers. So um, yeah, get in touch with us if you have any questions or, or any suggestions on anything you want us to, to cover or break down for you. Um, and also any men, any men on this um, webinar, which I'm sure there's a few. Yeah, tell your partners, your sisters, your daughters, um, because I think yeah, if, yeah, power is definitely knowledge. Oh, knowledge thanks, is Victoria. Power. <laughs> <laughs> the other way around. <laughs> Finish me nice. on a quote. And get it right. To you. <laughs> uh, thanks for putting that together. That was awesome, and that's a great platform you put together and helping a lot of people. Definitely have questions. Um, mm -hmm. And we probably won't get to all of them, but we'll get uh, the ones we don't get to. We'll we'll, we'll answer back. But what? Do, well, I'll start with these ones. Um, some of the basics. Do you educate your audience on ESG and responsible investing, and how big is that becoming? Yes, good question. Um, we actually had an event during lockdown, so a couple of weeks ago now, that was purely on that on ESG investing, conscious investing responsible visit, whatever you want to call it. It was, um, yeah, and it was so well received. Um, I am actually a portfolio manager at Devon on our sustainability fund. So that's what I do day to day um, and is investing in, in those companies that, um, you know, have a positive impact on the environment or, or are low carbon emitting companies. And, you know, we, we are seeing, you know, this huge wall of money come into, um, into these ESG ESG companies. And I think it's going to be one of the biggest trends that I'm definitely going to probably see in, in my career. And, and I'm speaking to the older guys in the industry that they're seeing is just um, that, that, that change and that focus in terms of allocating money to companies that are, are doing good. Um, and yeah, it's definitely becoming more and more of a investing focus. Yeah, great answer. Thank you. Um, another question about around the, the different types of investments that you that or topics that you'll get into. Obviously, there's there's uh, equity stocks. Um, do you do you deal with advice on on real estate and um, property? You know, I guess apart from property funds, but individual property purchases. We we did an event yes on investing in stocks versus investing in properties and that was more just about uh, educating people on on options. Um, we we don't we do tend to have a bias to investing in stocks and companies, but when it comes to someone building their wealth, property does very much come into that. So um, we do educate people on on the use of leverage, for example, fixed and floating rates, that kind of thing. Um, I think with New Zealand though. <sighs> The level of understanding of property is, is probably a, a bit higher than than it is in terms of, of stocks and invest and investments in stocks and companies. And I think that's because you know with the property market's done so well, everyone talks about property, everyone knows someone or is, who's trying to get on the ladder or is on the ladder and, and all that. So it's a mo much more discussed um, at barbecues, for example, um, than it is uh, you know what stocks you own or, or, or the like. Um, so we're really trying to I guess balance out that conversation and just say you know there are other options um, and it's not just stocks and property either you know there's there's other options um, to add to your portfolio as well. It's just yeah. More about opening up the, the the conversation around other ways to grow your wealth, really. Yeah, yeah, it definitely mm -hmm. makes sense. There, are, there. Are, I'll, I'll do one more question, and then we'll move on, and then get you the rest. Um, this is a good yeah. question. So, it's. Uh, do you have any advice for women that are looking to get into the funds management industry? Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, good question. I'd say go for it. <laughs> we need more women. We need more women in the industry. So please, please. Um, no, I guess it was one of the things that I noticed um, and I wasn't aware of, I guess, was was how few women are in the industry. And I guess that also in itself comes back to why women are um, less knowledgeable on investing is, and because there's, there's less women in the industry. Um, but I think 
we we come with our own way of looking at, at, at companies and looking um, for trends and investing trends and themes, which can really play to our advantage. Like I remember years ago, I was trying to recommend investing to the investment team in this jewellery retailer, and I was I was talking like my invest, the investment teams I've been in a. Uh, are always always um, men and I'm either the first or the only female in the investment team. So I was pitching this idea and none of them really could comprehend and fair enough you know, that they that why this retailer was doing so well. And I was kind of like, look, all my friends are shopping there. Um, you know, this is just going absolutely nuts amongst amongst women. Um, we have to invest in it. And I think that's when I kind of realized I can actually add value here is um, you know, a diff as a different perspective when it comes to looking for investing trends and themes. So we can really, really add value. And, and it comes back to any, um, any diversity, really, you know, having a group of people from different backgrounds, ages, um, ethnicities, um, genders, you know, searching for investment ideas is, can be really, really, um, really, really vital and, and really kind of be successful. So yeah, I'd say go yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah, great, great answer. And people, really appreciate your thoughts there. Yeah, people think um, it's a lot about sitting behind spreadsheets and, and um, you know, punching out numbers. And yes, there's that side of it, but a lot of it is out and about meeting really cool companies. So that's what I love about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, Victoria, thank you very much for, for taking the time to put, put those thoughts and slides together. Great job. And we will get you more questions, I'm sure, um, after this, and, and we'll follow up with those of you that ask questions that we weren't able to get to. So. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Doug. Okay, so now we will move on to our next presenter. Um, we have uh, uh, David Stevens with us. He's the CEO of Harmony. Harmony is a, a company that listed on the NZX and ASX back in November. Uh, David, um, uh, like I said, the CEO of Harmony, they are the largest on. on online personal lending platform in New Zealand and Australia. David has extensive experience in the non-bank, consumer, and commercial finance sectors and was instrumental in the IPO of Harmony. So I'm going to turn it over to David right now and uh, and we will be back with questions. So David, you can take from here. Great. Thanks, Doug, and thank you for everyone's time today. Um, so we've got myself, I'm the CEO of Harmony. Um, started with the business over two years ago now. I uh, spent about the last 15 years in consumer and commercial finance. Uh, nine years of those being uh, running, um, and previously that CFO of Flexi Group, uh, now, now branded Hum. So very familiar with the space. Uh, spent a lot of time both in Australia and New Zealand as part of that role, and obviously now based in Auckland, um, with, with Harmony. So to give you an idea, Harmony is an online personal direct lender that operates across Australia and New Zealand, uh, providing customers with unsecured personal loans that are easy to access, competitively priced, using risk-based risk adjusted interest rates and access 100% online. So the presentation I've got today is uh, the, an abridged version of what we gave to the market for our full year 21 financial results. There's a little bit of financials in the start, but this is really the key drivers of, of the Harmony business. It's really around account acquisition. We're, we're generating around 10,000 accounts a month across Australia and New Zealand. So it gives a pretty big number for a business that uh, never meets a person. There's no, there's no broker introduced um, relationships. There's no, it doesn't come through retail. It purely comes 100% through our platform. Uh, with a consistent marketing program uh, following our IPO last, last November, we've uh, you can see the growth we've been able to achieve in Australia at 260%. And we've also been achieving that growth at, at good margins. So you can see our net lending margin of about 7% and our net interest margin of about 11%. So it gives you, uh, it shows we're writing really profitable business. Um, originated over 2.1 billion in, in loans uh, since our inception in 2014. That's across Australia and New Zealand. So certainly the largest uh, player in this space across the regions. Uh, how does this all come together? Uh, this is our, what we call our Harmony Growth flywheel on the, the right hand side of the page. Uh, we've got a lot, spent a lot of money on our, our marketing investment and our marketing tech. Uh, that creates high volume accounts. I just mentioned before that we have around 10,000 accounts um, per month. Then we go on to how does that 
that, that data then gets used to build out our tech and our data intelligence capability, which actually allows us to maximize our conversion and retention. And that ultimately leads to superior margins. Why is this model so important? You can see from this slide that we have broker models where people, uh, financiers are sort of given customers that they expect to be approved. They get very limited data. Because we're getting a huge amount of data from customers across Australia and New Zealand, we're actually learning from that every time and helping to build our, our credit our scorecards out so we can actually make more accurate decisions and more appropriately uh, appropriate decisions every time we do a loan of the systems learning so we can get better at approving the, the customers that we um, that are they're appropriate for the, the particular amount they're asking for and, and obviously not approving customers that, that, aren't, that aren't quite right. You can see how we get better over time and the only way you really get better over time with this is data and, and that's where Harmony really has a competitive advantage. You can see that our new scorecard that we put in in Australia in February and in New Zealand in June, uh, that's increased the conversion rate. So that would mean we're actually allow, able to lend to more borrowers. And on the right step hand side of the page, it actually shows you that when we compare it to price scorecards that we had implemented, it's performing 25% better. So what, why, why is that good? Because we can approve more customers. Ultimately, that's what we want to do. Customers, those 10,000 customers that come to us every month want to, um, uh, ultimately uh, coming to us for a reason. So the more of those that, that we can approve in a risk, in a risk managed way and responsible lending way, uh, the, the, the better it is for them and the better it is for us. And what that's the chart on the right shows that we're actually able to approve more customers and do it at a lower lower risk level to the business, which is, which is obviously the, you know, that's, that's the goal we want to continue striving for and uh, what we're doing a pretty good job at. I mentioned on the first page that we've got significant account growth. We're over 700,000 um, direct Harmony accounts now, um, which, is, which is huge for, for this space. How are we able to get this? We have a unique collaboration with Google and uh, that continues to support us as we move towards a million accounts, which is not, is not too far away. Uh, the chart on the right, you can see that uh, non-bank or fintech market share compared to the big banks is significantly increasing and has been for quite some time. That's something that's probably not news to anybody. Um, why has that come about? Um, obviously, the, the big four banks have dominated the, the Australian and New Zealand market for quite some time. Uh, however, with the increase of technology and data that we're able to access now, that competitive advantage has, has largely gone away. Um, and how do we do this efficiently? We actually, this is something that, you know, not a lot of people talk about in the market, but I believe a, a true um, measurement of a, of a FinTech, as we want to call it, it's a, you know, finance and tech together, is we actually, two thirds of our loan applications are actually assessed with no human intervention. So that's a key difference that we actually are able to uh, assess a loan and bear in mind that the loan isn't just being assessed as approved or declined, it's being assessed as approved or declined at around 25 different risk and pricing levels. So we offer interest rates anywhere from around 699 up to 19.99% and there's about 20, 20 25 risk grades that sit within that uh, and that will be depending on the person's profile. So this is something that really you can only do with a system. Uh, having a human do this, um, whilst we could have, we've got quite a few people on the call today, we could all have a look at the a, a profile and look at a, a credit policy, and hope and maybe maybe we all come to the same conclusion that the customer is approved or declined. But for us to accurately uh, assess the customer as being a you know the, we're an eight percent or a nine percent or a ten percent would be almost um, impossible statistically. So uh, automation is very important. Also with the automation, what that also does on our next slide, it actually shows that whilst our revenue increases, our costs don't. So because we're not having to add uh, people to the organisation to assess deals. So you can see from our the chart on the right that uh, we've given guidance through our FY22 um, revenue of around 92 million. And you can see that's going up, whereas the cost base is actually staying flat or um, starting to even come down a little bit as a percentage. So that's the true markings of a, a scalable um, fintech business. And that's something I'm very proud that Harmony um, just um, a shush, uh, presents itself. This gives you an idea of uh, where we sit. So our average interest rates around 16%, uh, net interest margin of 10.6. 
a net lending margin of 6.8. What net lending margin is simply uh, after after losses. So um, top line's interest income on the loans, less the interest expense um, getting down to uh, after losses is the net lending margin of 6.8%. So very healthy when you compare to um, some other listed peers in the space. Uh, you can see that it, where our, our book sits, very much uh, competing against the, you know, the big four banks and the, the, the probably more household name type um, uh, businesses. And uh, you know, we, why, why, why are we able to offer lower rates at the bottom end than the, at the, in the single digits and the banks don't do that? Because we have better systems and better processes to assess. Um, while some of the, the, some of the businesses that have been around a lot longer might have uh, longer history and more brand name recognition and the like, you can see that by offering a customer a superior experience and actually a superior product and superior terms, they actually um, choose to take loans out with you. In terms of our strategy and outlook, uh, you can see that we've, uh, you know, this is nothing new, but I think it's just worth to refresh people's minds that um, e-commerce e e sales as a percentage of, uh, share of percentage of retail sales continues to increase uh, across the board. You can see from the big four banks continue to shut branches down um, 350 almost over the um, course of the last 18 months. So you can see that the market is moving to a, a direct model. Why go direct? You can get a better deal. That's ultimately it. You know, there's no party sitting in the middle, that um, broker or uh, retailer or the like that, that's ultimately taking a, a commission. Uh, we don't, that's not how, how our business operates. It's direct with the customer. And why that's important too is because we have a huge repeat base of our customers that uh, you've done a transaction with us once and then come back to us in the future. And they don't, they don't there's no intermediary they're dealing directly with the, the person lending the money. Uh, in terms of this, you know, we've just talked about our expansion into Australia. If we're able to replicate the same success that we've had in New Zealand in the larger Australian market, that translates to about a billion dollars a year in new business and our three R's, which is that circle there, which actually is our repeat program that I just discussed uh, 30 seconds or so ago. That's about a billion dollars a year in originations uh, across Australia, which is um, very exciting for us. Um, this is probably a key slide of the deck. What it shows you today, uh, and you know, bear in mind we're only starting, this business was only started in 2014 uh, in New Zealand. This um, donut, if you like on the left, the what it shows is today, we're getting a mention around that 10,000 accounts a month. So just over, we originated 67,000 new accounts in the six months from January to June this year. Of those, we the, the what, what we funded was that dark red area. So around about 10%. Okay, the, the grey area is uh, an area that probably a, the particular borrower was unsuitable for a Harmony product. But there's a whole, that pink area is a huge, what we're calling our untapped potential. So there's a huge amount of customers that come to us, even so 30,000 uh, customers that, came, that, that provide us their bank data and we're able to analyse their transactional history. So what that means is a lot of those customers may have been approved for a loan. They may have, they may have not been quite right at this point in time for a loan. Maybe the loan we offered wasn't quite uh, where um, they, they they wanted. They needed, they needed to be from a risk perspective. So what we're doing is we've launched new scorecards in Australia and New Zealand, as I mentioned, it's the Libra 1.7 and 1.8. That's done, that's implemented. We're offering things like, as we do system enhancements post IPO, seven year term, for example. We currently only issue three and five year terms and that's really a legacy off our peer to peer um, uh, model where, where Harmony started. Um, why does that make sense? It actually allows customers to be able to service a loan better by having it over a longer term. It doesn't mean they may still pay it back in a few years, but it allows them to uh, balance, manage payments better. Uh, co-borrow. In Australia, for example, um, we don't have co-borrowers, so we have to take the one income, but take the whole household expenses. So that doesn't make a lot of sense when, um, you know, quite often the loan's being used into a household. So there's enhancement, there's other enhancements down the track. So really what it does is, the purpose of this slide is really to show you that that red area, that dark red area is moving constantly more into that pink area. And that's really the opportunity um, for the business. And this is with our, our same marketing spend. So if we're able to move that red area into the pink area more, it's coming without no additional marketing costs. So that's where the economics start to become very attractive for the business because we're already getting the customers to our website. And if you speak to any online um, 
um, company, you know, whether, whether they're in financial services or, or elsewhere, the hardest thing when you don't have a, you know, a, a household brand name, and, and even if you do, it's actually fine and getting customers to come to your website. We're actually really good at doing that, so which is great. So we, but we need to get better at using the data capability that we've generated and modifying our products to uh, appeal to to more customers and, and help them uh, ultimately get what they they sought to achieve by uh, coming to Harmony. And then lastly, this is our our guidance to the market. Uh, so we've. Um, we did the results presentation, the FY21 was our actual results. Uh, so that's to, for the year to 30 June 21. And then we're giving guidance for uh, the, the financial year 22, which is July to June uh, 22. So we're forecasting over 20% growth in receive, in group loan book, um, not over 92 million in group revenue, uh, maintaining or slightly increasing a net lending margin of around 7% and then uh, continue to reduce the OPEX to income ratio, which is a key driver of the, of the point. And then we also uh, expect that to um, be around 90% uh, our transition from peer-to-peer uh, -to, -peer to being warehouse funded to be about 90% complete uh, by the end of um, June uh, next year. So um, that's all my presentation. Hopefully you think that was right on time. So uh, I'll hand over back to back for some questions. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. That's fantastic. Definitely have some questions um, on the on the information. Again, have probably more than we'll get to, but I'll, I'll hit you with a few here. Um, how does Harmony control bad debt, and what percentage is this currently sitting at, maybe versus the the big four um, or or other competitors? Yeah, sure. So our reported um, actual losses were about 3.9% in, uh, in financial year 21. Uh, so um, a really, really pleasing result. In any business like ours, there'll always be a portion of bad debt. Um, you know, and that's typically because someone's circumstances may have changed or they uh, you know, run into some sort of um, um, lifestyle or financial difficulty. Um, we, we work with customers and we did right through, uh, right from when COVID started, in sort of March last year when we had early COVID. Um, we helped a lot of customers uh, with, with hardships at the time. Most of them didn't need it in the end uh, because the, uh, the, the, I think everyone, certainly uh, level four this time around was very different to level four last time. Uh, last time they didn't really look like there was, you know, there was much light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, there was no vaccine even invented and we'd met, no one in this life, in this world had seen a, a pandemic before. So uh, this time around, it was everything, everyone's taken their stride and just looking to forward to getting back to normal. Um, so we, we, we absolutely manage that. Um, uh, we have a, a collections team that, that work, with, work with customers. And uh, yeah, look, it's, it's part of the business and something that we, um, uh, we, we, we work together, we, we work with customers, we use technologies to make that easier um, uh, for customers. And uh, yeah, you can see that even after our, um, our bad debt, uh, you can see that the net, the, the, the net income, net operating income, if you like, is still around that 7% mark, which is really strong. And uh, comparing to other competitors in the market, now the banks don't typically disclose down to this level. Um, they tend to keep it a little bit higher level and mix in uh, credit cards and various other consumer finance in their in their numbers uh, typically, uh, but we, we we perform really well from what uh, the, what we've seen through different bureaus and the like because we are lending fully risk based price. We're lending customers you know that are um, you know a six percent interest rate, which is six or seven percent interest rate, which is lower than any of the banks lend, and getting the, the really top end top customers in terms of uh, credit credit worthiness as well. And then we obviously lend the customers. Uh, yeah, as well that are at slightly lower ends, and we we might we, we lend right from two thousand dollars to seventy thousand dollars. So, um, someone at say a, a sixteen percent interest rate wouldn't necessarily qualify for a seventy thousand dollar loan, um, but they might qualify for a twenty thousand dollar loan. So we we manage it um, in accordance with responsible lending procedure. Um, procedures and uh, ensure it's uh, things are, are managed so the customer uh, is getting the right loan and that they can uh, afford it. Nice, thank you. Um, another question that came up is about growth and will would acquisitions be part of the growth strategy going forward? 
Yeah, look, I think, um, you know, I've from a background where I bought eight companies um, when I was at Flexi Group, and uh, M&A is always something that is a consideration, but it needs to be opportunistic M&A, in, in my opinion. It, you need to build a business to grow organically, but sure, if you can use M&A to uh, speed up or, or enhance something that you're doing or enable you to maybe move into a slightly different a slightly different adjacency um, where there's good um, good synergies and the like that can come across from both, you know, particularly from a revenue standpoint, um, OPEX, you know, they're, they're good to have synergies in OPEX, but they, they tend to be one-off more than anything. But if you can do a good reason for why, you know, one plus one equals more than two. Uh, yeah, you should carefully look at. But yeah, look, M and I, I do look at. But you know, it's something that you tend to look at a lot of deals before you actually uh, find the right one. Yep, yep. Thank you. Um, so we're going to do one more question, then we'll move on and get you the rest afterwards. But this is an interesting question about the resiliency of Harmony's business model in a recessionary environment. Not a COVID environment, but a, but a standard recessionary environment in terms of um, consumer protections and, and government support uh, um, versus, again, uh, um, competitors? Yeah, look, well, look um, as I said, you know, we one, one thing about our business is we have a very diversified portfolio. So um, in the full year results presentation, you can see the demographic of where people work, um, what uh, the percentage of household, uh, people own, own their own homes, uh, versus people renting uh, the, the geographical split of the of the book as well, and it's 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 really diverse. And the, the best thing to uh, manage risk in a business like this is to be diverse. Um, you don't want to be generating all your business from a, a particular sector or a particular um, a group of um, of the population, because if there's something to happen in a particular area, you've got large exposure. Through diversification, you uh, you, you really mitigate that risk. And having customers, um, you know, having that mix and that that um, the demographic that I mentioned allows you to manage that uh, really closely. And uh, yeah, look, we. Um, we run uh, all sorts of um, our own credit scorecard over applications. We stress test them. To, so if, if, if customers, if things do change, and then we work with customers whilst they, you know, they might be between jobs, and and that can happen for everyone uh, can lose their job in their careers. Um, but you know, quite often, you know, we'll get back on the, another job not too far away and look to uh, get back on track. So. Um, so yeah, look, it's uh, you know absolutely it's a it's a question, but we also have a fairly big uh, interest margin as well that allows us to absorb some of that. You know, if we've lost the tick up a little bit, you know that's okay. It's something that we 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 manage, um, but it's also something that is somewhere we have a lot of focus around it and why we've been we've assessed over seven billion dollars worth of loans since we've been going, and that gives you huge data to understand customers. Uh, particular financial positions, both in times like now and, and uh, you know pre-COVID, COVID, and and beyond COVID, and it's something that we you know that's why that's why our business is going as well as it is because we, we we really use that data um, in a in a very uh, scientific way. Yeah, yeah, nice, well, David. Awesome, really appreciate it. Um, great presentation, and and thanks again for taking the time to put that together. And we'll get you more questions. And um, yeah, thanks again. Thanks, Doug. Jeez, thank you, everyone. No worries. Um, all right, so now we'll move on to our final presenter. Um, whoops, let me just get my... Um, presenting now is Graham Law. Graham is the CFO of NZX, so we see him around the halls quite a bit. Um, he's been at the exchange since 2017 and has considerable experience working across the financial and professional service sectors in... Um, New Zealand and the UK. So Graham, thank you very much for, for um, doing this and I will turn it over to you and get back with questions shortly. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Okay. Okay, so today I'm just going to do a, a quick run through the last four years and then look at a snapshot of our uh, half year financials, which were the 30 June, and then finish up just with our strategy refresh that we did uh, recently. Before I start, because it is off uh, interim results rather than final results, I just draw everybody's attention to the important notice. Essentially, it's the standard caveats that anything uh, that I say that could be forward-looking uh, contains assumptions as to 
market outcomes and global health, uh, the global health environment, etc. Um, so just going back through history, in 2017, uh, our CEO Mark Peterson joined and reset the the strategy. Uh, fundamentally, it was focused on four areas. Um, the first was the the core markets, where we undertook or decided to undertake a, a review of the the rule set. Um, wanted to transform our product and service offering, grow issuers and participants, and ultimately increase value traded and on market liquidity. The growth opportunities that we've seen in our business related to dairy derivatives and the debt market. And um, we wanted to maximize our option businesses, which were smart shares or funds management business and wealth technologies or advisor platform business. And then at the same time, we wanted to, to get fit. Um, what that meant was divesting of known core businesses, uh, resetting the capital structure, automating uh, operating processes and moder moder modernizing the IT infrastructure where we, we could. Um, through 2018, we, we really seen that uh, blockages that we've been encountering that stopped growth started to disappear. So we did sell the non-core businesses. It, it may be interesting for people to know that we owned several agricultural magazines and they were sold. Uh, we changed um, some of the policy settings and pricing settings that were aimed at driving up value traded and on market liquidity. Uh, we implemented the start of our technology upgrades and we de-risked the balance sheet with the introduction of uh, subnotes um, and uh, a mutualized default fund for the derivatives business, uh, which essentially meant that if a GFC event occurred again, that um, we had control of our own destiny. In 2019, we started to see uh, proof points uh, in that the strategy was working. Essentially, all our key matrix were up uh, at, at that point. And um, yeah, we were starting to see a lift in, in staff engagement as well. And I'll come back to the key matrix and how we've done in the first half of 2021. Uh, 2020 was a tough year for many of our clients. Um, it showed really the, the vital, how vital the capital markets are to New Zealand. Um, we enabled Kiwi companies to access billions of dollars in much needed debt and equity during that period of time. Um, and, and as a result of that, we saw an extraordinary uh, step change in our core markets businesses and, and the actual key matrix um, jumped quite significantly. Um, we also we also entered into two uh, partnerships for growth at that point. The first was the, the the carbon managed auction service for the Ministry of the Environment, in partnership with the European Energy Exchange, uh, which people may well be aware of the carbon credit auctions. Um, and then secondly, we entered into heads of agreement with the Singapore Stock Exchange on the global partnership uh, to grow our uh, dairy derivative market, and I'll come back to it and how it's going. Um, and again, we continued our drive towards a more mature IT and infrastructure capability. Now up to 2021, and um, you know we set we set our objectives at the start of the year to be very much focused on continuing to grow markets, maximising our financial services businesses, and empowering our operational performance. So how have we done against that? Well, our this is a slide from our half year presentation. I'll talk individually about the key matrix, which are across the bottom on, on a second on individual slides. But essentially, um, at, a, at a total level, uh, you know, we, we, the first half of 2021, we've largely maintained the performance that we had in 2020, even though we're coming off the extraordinary peaks of 2020. Um, Overall, our operating earnings were down 3.5% and our NPAT 16%, uh, off from the record highs that we'd seen in the first half of 2020. So looking at the underlying matrix individually that drive our business, uh, firstly, capital raised. Um, the gra graph on the top left shows the capital raised over the last 10 years. The, the dotted lines are our strategic goals for 2023. Um, and, and really gives you an idea of how we've gone since we set those in 2018. Um, so since the introduction of the new strategy in 2018, 
capital's increased and, and you know it's shown by the bars being higher than the, the dotted lines but it is important to notice note the mix and, and that's what the graphic at the bottom of the page tries to show that um basically we are in higher fees on on equity than we do on uh retail debt than we do on wholesale debt than we do on funds uh so so equity is most important when it comes to to revenue um in the first half of 2020, we've seen a lot of secondary equity raised as firms recapitalized during that 2020 COVID period. Um, in 2021, it has been different in the same period where it's been primary equity that's been raised. And, and I've got a list of the, the, the raisings during the period. And, and most people have used all, all the options of getting to market, be it an IPO, a direct listing, a, a foreign exempt listing. We've also seen green bonds come out, come on board and, and other sustainable and ethical investments um, to raise capital. So you know, all, all the products that we introduced back in 2018 are, are coming to fruition with, with issuers and clients use, using those. And that, that growth has been driven by our issuer team you know, implementing what is an origination model. And we feel very confident about the active pipeline we're seeing in the future with regard to more capital being raised. Moving on to um, value traded in 2021, it's it's holding very close to the 2020 record levels and remains driven by the wholesale market. So the graphic shows a significant period of time and we, we seem to have plateaued um, before the new strategy came in at around the 36 billion mark. Last year was a phenomenal year at over 52 billion. And we're certainly on target to be somewhat similar this year, which really illustrates to us that the strategy has been working and that there is a step change in the market um, that's led, that removing all the blockages in 2018-19, sort of is leading us to achieve these higher levels of value traded and, and hence market liquidity. Um, so additionally, we've also been continuing to grow the depository business. Uh, which has seen assets under custody grow by 44%. Um, final comment on secondary markets: we did we did go live with our trading system upgrade in 20 in August uh, 21, just just a couple of months ago. And um, this is allowing us to bring in new functionality to market participants, such as NZ Dark, uh, which is on market, but you can't necessarily see um, the, the orders. And um, what this will do is effectively increase liquidity further and, and should liquidity drives liquidity so um, we're hoping for an increase on traded value in future periods because of that initiative <coughs> moving to our third um, key metric and that's that and insights revenue uh, the recurring revenue continues to grow faster than we had expected when we set the set the strategy back in 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 2017 um, and you can see again, it's it's tracking faster than we'd expected, but uh, being the bars higher than the dotted lines. And um, this has been driven by a strategic the strategic change that we made to ensure that clients um, were appropriately licensed after we undertook royalty audits. Um, so we're therefore securing the the royalty audit revenue stream rather than relying on a retrospective check and negotiation of what they've actually used and, and that's fundamentally what's driving us in in, in that area um, fourth key matrix was dairy derivative lots sold um, now we've been impacted by a lack of volatility in the physical milk prices uh, over the last couple of years and we've, we've tapered off on our, our target growth but the, the key thing for us is the partnership with the Singapore Stock Exchange um, it will be our products that are listed, uh, listed, traded and cleared on their market. What that allows us to do is essentially expand the connectivity uh, and connecti connectivity to um, trading and clearing members. So currently in our market, there are only four, but there are 86 on the Sing Singapore Stock Exchange. Um, this actually facilitates speculative firms to start entering the market and trade uh, dairy derivative lots and, and that's why we believe there'll be growth going forward to achieve this sort of global presence we've had to share future revenues with the stock exchange and and we do expect a significant increase in lots to then be um, going forward into the future 
So moving to uh, smart shares, the fund management business, as you can see from the graph, it's going fantastically well. It's funds under management um, are approximately 5.8 billion now, which is above the top end of where we expected to get to by 2023. That's been driven by a combination of both strong cash flows and, and market return. Uh, you know, we believe the, mo the macro drivers of, of the ETF trajectory remain the same in that Kiwi Saver future growth will, will continue to accumulate funds under management and that the ETF usage in, the, in New Zealand will increase, increase over time. Um, additionally, I uh, just want to note that the smart shares business won Kiwi Saver default provider status. And that will go live in December uh, when we get um, the fund uh, started and the inflow of transfers from other default providers. We expect that will have a, a halo effect um, going forward. Wealth Technologies business, um, the funds under administration now sit at 8 billion. As you can tell from the graph, we're, we're not tracking at the same pace that we had originally expected. Um, that's largely because the development of the platform and the migration of the first few clans took longer than expected. Um, we believe the micro drivers for growth still remain, and, and they are essentially that uh, as firms uh, are overloaded with a compliance obligation and that increases their cost to serve, that it makes our wealth tech platform um, SaaS uh, software as a service offering more attractive to clients. Um, hence, our future client pipeline remains strong. We expect to be over 10 billion come the end of the year on funds under management, and we still believe our 2023 aspirational targets remain valid, uh, given the size of some of the clients that we are talking to. Um, finally, just on our, our global partnerships um, and, and growth prospects in those, uh, Key additional thing is we expect that BNP Paribas to become a general clearing participant in late 2021. I've already mentioned um, the successful launch of the emissions trading scheme in partnership with the EEX and uh, the dairy derivatives move um, to trading and clearing of the Singapore exchange is expected later in the year. And, and I don't know if people have seen it when it was announced, but um, given it was during the COVID period when we announced it, there was a virtual announcement with uh, Mark Peterson, our CEO, um, and uh, uh, Boom Chai, the SDX CEO, clinking milk glasses. <coughs> um, quickly going on then to our, our refresh of our strategy. Um, so we, we refreshed it midway through uh, the five-year cycle, and that was last year. The heart of our strategy remains the same. We have recognized that our fund management business and our advisor platform businesses are delivering value both to New Zealand uh, NZX shareholders and the broader New Zealand market uh, in general. And we continue to build a more diversified um, exchange with the aim of having an integrated business to support gro further growth in the capital markets. Um, our strategy, uh, our strategy is really to have an exchange model that enables a virtuous, a virtuous uh, circle of growth. Um, in that increased products, be it listed equity debt funds, attracts capital flows, which in turn results in increased trading and liquidity, which creates more data, which can be turned into insights to drive more capital flows, and hence the cycle starts again. And certainly over the last three to four years, we have, we have seen that with um, increases in capital raised and funds under administration, resulting in increased in trading value and an increase in on-market um, value traded or liquidity, uh, which in turn drives more data requirements for clients. We add insights to that and it drives more capital flows and attracts new listings, which provides more product, which then attracts more capital and it, it goes round and round. So um, we are seeing that strategy pan out uh, more so now than we had uh, anticipated at the start. Um, so going forward, uh, we're, we're pretty clear on our strategic focus um, being that we want to make sure with um, we, we, we gain higher levels of capital raised and, and FUM, um, that we increase trading and clearing value traded and liquidity. Um, 
we increase data requirements uh, from from clients, and they ultimately will drive capital flows, attracting new listings, and growing the market in general. So I will pause there and, and go back, hand back to Doug. Thanks, thanks, Graham. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, that's that's really good overview, and had had some good questions, I think. Um, and I'll just get into them. What is the um, in terms of the smart shares default win, what's the projected revenue impact uh, for NZX on that deal? Yeah, so we haven't provided that yet, and we're likely to do that at year end. What we're waiting to find out is the actual fund that trans transfers over from other Kiwi uh, default providers. We're still to have confirmation of that. Um, Initially, it won't be a lot. I think I mentioned the halo effect on the way through, and that's where we see the benefit. We haven't previously been uh, a default uh, fund provider. I think it will attract new people to see what our products and our offerings are, uh, and it, it will be uh, very marketable to us. The, the key advantage we have is that we are the cheapest of the default fund providers. It is a balanced fund, whereas historically default fund providers have been uh, very conservative. So there is that change that the graphs that we've seen in the first presentation, it, it does move us towards the, the second and third graph. We're quite lucky in that. And, and if I'm sitting as a, a Kiwi Saver member in a balanced fund at the moment, I can compare and contrast the passive versus the active uh, returns and the differential in the in the um, fees that are charged. And ours is a flat straight up 20, 20 bips, uh, as opposed to others who charge a management fee plus add-ons. So I think the fee level and the relative returns will attract other other customers, and that ultimately will drive um, a halo effect across across our funds management business. Nice, thank you. Um, the next question is kind of a two-parter, and I'll mix it together. In the in the last slide, I believe you mentioned some of the key areas of focus. One of which was new listings, um, and would would you see that as the biggest driver of, of revenue or your biggest area of focus? And regardless of, of that answer, when you talk about new listings, what what is the biggest barrier that you see in terms of launching new products on the exchange? Things like Bitcoin and SPACs uh, is is the is the regulatory environment supportive of, of new product offerings like that? Uh, I think the, re the, the regulatory environment could always be better given they are new types of product that were never contemplated by current regulation. So um, I wouldn't say they're adverse to them, but uh, they can all, there can always be improvements. Uh, I think um, you know, it, it is a virtuous circle. Every bit helps each other. So certainly having more participants will encourage more trading, will encourage more capital, which encourage more issuers. It's just where do you start that that circle? Um, certainly the more issuers we have, then, you know, it, it, the more participants we'll have, the more cap, cash flow, uh, sorry, uh, capital flows we'll have. So um, they're all interrelated. I think it's one big ecosystem. Uh, the press tends to focus on, on one aspect of, of it, and that is issuer. But it is more than that. It's it's an ecosystem that all parts of have to actually get behind and and um, be pushing forward that we can all benefit from. Um, it's not just about NZX. It's about everyone in that ecosystem. So it's important, undoubtedly, and it is a focal point for Doug and his team. And I think we're we're better placed than we've been placed for the last three, four, five years, we, we're very encouraged by our, by our pipeline, but by the same token, we never count chickens until they, they absolutely hatch and, and things can change like COVID and that can change people's people's uh, plans and we'll just you know count those chickens when they arrive, but we are encouraged by what we see. Yep, well said. Well, Graham, I uh, really appreciate you taking the time, great overview and presentation and, um, and thanks again for putting those slides together. We will end it here. We're just a little after three. Any other questions, please shoot them forward and we'll send an email out to, to all the recipients on the um, on the call with the questions and the link to the video if you want to watch it again. But thanks again to Victoria, David, and Graham and uh, everyone for joining us. So uh, thank you and have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you.